So welcome again. Uh, I just want to start out by saying I have no uh, financial disclosures for this presentation. Okay, so I wanted to start out with a, a case in urgent care because we um, are all taking care of patients and that's why we're here is to provide the best care we can for the patients we see in our urgent cares. And it, and it touches on a few points that I want to cover during my presentation. And I did want to also say I do tend to talk a little bit fast. So I've asked Robin if you guys place in chat that I need to slow down. Um, just let me know and she'll give me a heads up. So our case today is an 18 month old girl. She's had multiple episodes of non-bloody non-bilious emesis. Her parents don't really know how many per day. They, they say she's just been vomiting all day long and she's had four episodes of watery non-bloody diarrhea. Uh, her weight's 12 kilos. She's eight febrile, a little bit tachycardic. Her blood pressure is normal at 90 over 65. Her respiratory rate's normal and oxygen saturation's normal. To add a little bit more to her history, she's been otherwise healthy, no travel or animal exposure, no recent antibiotic use, and she does attend daycare, but there have been no reports from daycare about ill contacts there. On her exam, she is crying tears. She has tacky mucous membranes. Her eyes appear to be slightly sunk in view, but her abdominal exam is pretty normal without tenderness or rebound or guarding, and her peripheral capillary refill is two to three seconds. When you examine her, you see yellow colored stool in her diaper, and then she has one episode of vomiting while you're examining her. So this poll is just to gauge how you would manage this patient at the beginning of my talk and to see if it changes by the end. So what would you do for this patient in this situation? First, would you transfer to the ED? Would you start some oral rehydration? Would you do a BMP and UA? Or would you place an IV and give a fluid bolus? Okay, sorry about that. Um, and I can't see the poll results, but I will um, check them at the end of the presentation because like I said, this is just to gauge what you would do um, before I go through my presentation. The objectives for today are, I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of AGE in the pediatric population. And, and AGE, I'm using that to designate acute gastroenteritis. I hope that you'll be able to name the indications for laboratory evaluation of these patients, uh, use correct antiemetics and the appropriate candidates, and use oral rehydration strategies for mild to moderately dehydrated patients, as well as name some evidence-based home care strategies for your patients and families. I'm gonna walk through etiology, differential diagnosis, evaluation, treatment, and home care. And one more poll before we get started, and I'm hoping that somebody can pop in and let me know the results of this one because I'm unable, obviously, to, to see the poll without closing my presentation. So which of the following is necessary to diagnose acute gastroenteritis? Vomiting, vomiting and diarrhea, diarrhea alone, or fever? We have it, people answering now. I'll give it maybe a few seconds, then let you know. Okay. Uh, it looks like <laughs> Sorry about that. I think I sh shared my email for a moment. So hopefully. Uh, <laughs> Looks like so far vomiting and diarrhea is in the lead uh, with seven votes and, and climbing. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it looks like that's what most people are voting for, vomiting and diarrhea. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you letting me know that. And I, I'm glad I brought it up because for gastroenteritis, you have to have diarrhea and that is with or without vomiting. So vomiting alone would not be considered gastroenteritis. Diarrhea alone could be considered gastroenteritis and you can definitely have vomiting and diarrhea with gastroenteritis. And as for a definition, diarrhea is of course a change in stool consistency and technically has to be three or more in 24 hours. And acute gastroenteritis is the di diagnosis that is most commonly given for patients who present to the acute care area with nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. As far as causes of gastroenteritis, viruses are by far the most common cause. 80% of the time, a virus is going to be causing AGE in our pediatric patients, with norovirus being the leading cause. Rotavirus has obviously declined since the vaccination has been implemented, but it still remains a significant cause, especially in developing countries. 
Sapovirus, astrovirus, and enteric adenovirus, those are all additional viral causes of AGE. And these viruses can differ slightly in their presentation and in the time of year that they're most prevalent, but we don't really distinguish between them because it doesn't change our management. Bacteria tend to cause a little bit more severe AGE, and the most common bacterial causes are Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter species. We all as urgent care providers know about antibiotic associated diarrhea with the most severe end of that, of course, being Clostridioides difficile. And finally, parasites are probably the least common cause of AGE in our pediatric patients, but definitely should still be considered, especially in patients who have had freshwater exposure or in daycare outbreaks. The differential di diagnosis of diarrhea is pretty broad. You want to keep in mind some severe causes just so you don't miss them. Uh, many of these are pretty rare, but again, if you don't think of it, you could miss it, which could be dangerous for your patients. Inflammatory bowel disease, which of course includes ulcerative colitis and, um, and Crohn's disease, is not something you're going to diagnose in urgent care, but it's important to keep in mind for those patients who are older. So teenage patients who present with watery or bloody diarrhea and will often have systemic symptoms as well. Toxic megacolon, again, a rare complication usually of inflammatory bowel disease, but it, it can be caused by any sort of inflammation of the colon, including acute gastroenteritis itself. These patients typically look very ill and have severe bloody diarrhea. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, also a rare complication of, of bacterial gastroenteritis in particular, which causes uh, anemia, acute kidney injury, and thrombocytopenia. These patients, again, appear very ill. It's usually a progression from watery diarrhea to bloody diarrhea. You're probably not going to keep them in urgent care. You'll probably send them on for more evaluation at a higher level. Allergic colitis is one to consider in your younger patients, especially less than three months, who may be displaying the first signs of a milk protein allergy. And the irritable bowel syndrome, while not, not very severe, and probably not going to be too harmful to your patient is another one to consider. Uh, and then finally, diagnosis like appendicitis, intussusception, volvulus, and hepatitis, they don't usually cause diarrhea alone, but they can all present with that symptom. All right, so moving on to our evaluation. The first thing to consider in your evaluation of the patient is, are they in shock or do they have altered mental status? And I think as a student, clinicians, we would all recognize that both of these things require emergent care and we'd transfer these patients out. And while you're waiting for your transport team, you want to do a glucose check, of course, with treatment if needed for hypoglycemia and give an IV fluid bolus or two, depending on how long your wait is. It's important to remember, I think some people on this call primarily treat adult patients, which um, is totally fine. I just wanted to point out that children in particular may have compensated shock, which is a normal blood pressure with tachycardia and delayed capillary, capillary refill. So hypotension in children is a very late finding when it comes to uh, severe dehydration and shock. So it's important to, to really pay attention to tachycardia in these situations. Uh, finally, I know we all know how to do a history and physical, but I did want to point out a few of the things in the history that might point you towards one diagnosis or another. You always want to ask about the color of vomiting and stools because bilious emesis is a sign of obstruction and should be taken seriously, and those patients should have a thorough evaluation for obstruction. As far as frequency goes, especially with stool output, put, this is important in infants because they may not have the ability to keep up orally with their stool output. Of course, bloody stools are going to be more commonly associated with bacterial rather than viral infections. Sick contacts, especially in like a childcare setting or, or in the household, of course, they're going to point towards a viral cause of gastroenteritis. Norovirus is, is highly contagious, and if multiple family members are getting sick very quickly within a household, it, it's most likely going to be norovirus. Of course, travel, depending on where your patients are traveling to, could point towards a bacterial infection. A current or recent antibiotic use, of course, points towards Clostridioides difficile or perhaps antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Many families are now having poultry in their home or in their yards, so chickens, and uh, people have reptiles as, as pets. So particularly if there is a new exposure to either of these, you would think about possible salmonella. I did, even though I said vomiting alone is not gastroenteritis, I did want to touch on it because sometimes we'll see patients who are vomiting alone 
where the most likely diagnosis might be gastroenteritis. What do you think is the most important first step in evaluation of these patients? Is it your analysis, BMP, head CT, or a thorough history and physical? All right, voting is live now. I'm just waiting a few moments and then I'll let you know what it looks like the top one is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so it looks like so far it's a thorough history and uh, and physical is what most people are voting for. Overwhelming majority. <laughs> Okay, awesome. That's great. And I would totally agree with that. I just wanted to, uh, to emphasize that vomiting alone, I would never diagnose that as gastroenteritis, even if I think it's the most likely diagnosis. So in a patient who's had a short period of vomiting less than 24 hours, that could very likely be the case that it's just early in gastroenteritis and they haven't had diarrhea yet. But until that diarrhea happens, you really can't say that it's AGE. And vomiting alone for greater than 24 to 48 hours is, is definitely not gastroenteritis. So you have to maintain a really broad differential with vomiting alone, including intracranial processes, such as especially in younger children, non-accidental trauma, endocrine causes like diabetes, new onset diabetes, and of course, GU causes like a UTI can be a cause of vomiting alone. And, and that's just a small sampling. And of course, if, if at the end you do decide even if it's just based on your history and exam alone, that this is most likely early AGE, you wanna make sure to give good return precautions to your patients. Moving on to our physical exam, we talked about compensated shock. Again, uh, tachycardia without hypotension could be a, a sign of that. Hypotension, again, is the late findings. Sometimes patients might have tachypnea, and that's to compensate for the metabolic acidosis that's associated with AGE, but it could also be a, a sign of, of new onset DKA as well. So it's important to consider that if you have patients with tachypnea. Of course, you're gonna assess for abdominal tenderness and peritoneal signs. Anything focal that's not diffuse mild tenderness, I would strongly advise considering that's probably not AGE. The, of course, right lower quadrant, you would consider appendicitis, epigastric pain, you consider like gastritis and perhaps pancreatitis. And of course, um, right upper quadrant pain, especially in the presence of jaundice, is a, is probably a hepato, hepatobiliary process. All of our patients with AGE, we do want to assess for dehydration. The gold standard is weight loss, but the main issues with that is you're measuring the patient on a different scale than they've ever been measured on before. And a lot of parents really don't have an immediately recent weight prior to the onset of illness. A lot of times their last weight is from their last well child check. So we really have to go with our clinical findings and our history as well. There are multiple clinical scales, including the World Health Organization, the clinical dehydration scale and the Gorlick scale, who, and, and these scales are designed to help us delineate between different levels of dehydration and guide our management. However, when you look at these in clinical practice, they are really good at identifying severe dehydration, but they fail to differentiate between mild and moderate dehydration. So more experienced clinicians are probably going to be able to identify severe dehydration pretty easily based on their physical exam alone and the history. But these skills might be more useful for novice clinicians and definitely for our learners if you have learners in your urgent care. And this is an example of one of the clinical dehydration scales, it's the Gorlick scale. You can see it, you can either use four points or 10 points. And you're looking at these characteristics here on the left side. And if, if they're present or absent, if you have greater than equal to two signs on the four point scale or five signs on the 10 point scale, that's moderately dehydrated. And then three points on the four point scale or seven points on the 10 point scale, that's gonna indicate severe dehydration. I did wanna to touch on laboratory evaluation and if it's needed or not. If, if your patient is mild or moderately dehydrated, there's really no labs needed. Severe dehydration based on expert recommendation level, really you wanna get a BMP or glucose if you're gonna start that IV and give IV fluids. So a good rule of thumb is if you're going to go ahead and place an IV, get the labs. If you don't think you need an IV, don't get labs. Of course, the exceptions to that rule include neonates who are a special category, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Anybody who's failed oral rehydration or anybody who needs or has altered mental status, you probably want to go and get those labs sooner rather than later. And are, a big question is, are these labs 
helpful in evaluating for dehydration? And the short answer is no, because you've already made your clinical assessment and decided how you're going to treat your patient by the time these labs come back. But there are a few correlating labs. So BICAR less than 17 is 77% and 94% sensitive for detecting moderate and severe dehydration. But but if you get when you get this back or you get any of these labs back, you likely already started rehydrating your patient. So it's probably not going to be um, accurate anymore. If you use bicarb on a clinical scale, that's 100% sensitive for dehydration. And BUN, increasing levels of BUN correlate with levels of dehydration and a BUN creatinine ratio of less than 20 would indicate no dehydration. But again, I want to emphasize that I would not use these labs clinically to evaluate for dehydration. Again, you've already made your assessment based on physical exam and you've already likely started rehydrating your patient. And what about stool cultures? When do we need those? I mentioned earlier bacterial AGE can be more severe than viral. So if you have a suspicion for bacterial AGE, especially because in certain cases it'll need treatment, I would go ahead and get the stool cultures. So bloody diarrhea, especially if it's longer than three or four days. If your patient looks very sick, of course, absolutely get bacterial cultures. And again, the risk factor of recent travel might encourage you to get bacterial cultures as well. Clostridioides difficile, you don't want to get this in kids less than age one because they're colonized with this bacteria. So that lab is not going to be accurate. And additionally, they typically don't get clinical illness from C. C. diff. It, but it is characterized by prolonged watery diarrhea in patients who have had recent antibiotic exposure. So those are the patients I would consider getting C. diff in. Ovum parasites, not always necessary, but again, recent exposure to fresh water or they've gone camping recently, or there's a daycare outbreak at that point, I would consider getting that one. All right, so moving on to treatment. I'm just gonna check my time here, see how I'm doing. I think I'm doing okay. Okay, next poll. What is the most important aspect of treating mild to moderate dehydration in pediatric patients with acute gastroenteritis? Is it oral rehydration, oral antiemetics, anti-diarrheal agents or IV fluids. Looks like we're getting some votes. Again, I'll give a few seconds and then let you know. Uh, it okay. looks like Thank everybody you. so far is voting oral rehydration. Okay. Yeah, look, that looks like the overwhelming majority choice for sure. Okay, awesome. Okay, are you sure you guys need to be here? Because <laughs> yes, I would say that's definitely my uh, first line treatment as well as and it would be recommended by the CDC and World Health Organization too. It's, it's important to use a oral rehydration solution if you can. So Pedialyte and Flight, or there are generic formulations of these trademark solutions. And that's because other fluids such as water, juice, sports drink, they don't really have that ideal sugar salt ratio for absorption into the intestine. And, and they can actually compound the problem by worsening that diarrhea by becoming an osmotic diuretic. There was a study in Canada, they looked at dilute apple juice versus ORS, but they only looked at mild, mildly dehydrated patients. Those patients who are mildly dehydrated actually did better with dilute apple juice compared to ORS, had less treatment failure. So the, the caveat to the rule about ORS might be if your patient's mildly dehydrated, perhaps the fluid of choice would be a better option for them. As far as the amount goes, this is really expert recommendation here, but five to 10 mLs every five minutes for the first 30 minutes, and then increase by five mLs over the next 30 minutes with a total goal of 50 to 100 mLs per kilo over three to four hours. And what about antiemetics? There's really only one that we use for children with acute gastroenteritis. It's important to note that on Dancitron, is not FDA approved for AGE, so it's considered an evidence-based off-label use of it, but it's been really well studied in the ED with really good and safe results. And presumably, evidence from the ED is gonna translate well into our urgent care setting. The studies have shown overwhelmingly that kids who get on Dancitron, so actively vomiting kids who get on Dancitron, are less likely to fail oral rehydration, they're less likely to require IV hydration, less likely to be admitted to the hospital. They leave the ED, presumably our urgent care sooner, and it's more cost-effective compared to the usual care or just oral rehydration therapy alone. 
in the after hours primary care setting, which again, I think will probably translate well to the US UC setting. And, and, you know, big bonus for all of us, we love to make our parents happy. It's also associated with increased parental satisfaction in the primary care setting. So I would consider on Dancitron for any patients who come into your urgent care with continued vomiting, and I would give it 15 to 30 minutes prior to you starting your ORT. The weight-based dosing is listed below. For the majority of patients I see, the ODT tablets or oral disintegrating tablets are a great option, unless, of course, they're, they're too young to get that, in which there, in case there are liquid preparations. Um, I did also want to say that it's been well-studied Zofran or Ondansetron has been well studied in children down to the age of six months, but not really younger than that. If you have patients in the you know six months to two years range who are in an appropriate weight range, you can do liquid-based dosing at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Of course, if you're going to start an IV anyway, you can consider giving the IV preparation at a 0.15 milligrams per kilogram dosing with a, a max dose of eight milligrams. If you're moving to IV hydration based on the appearance of your patient in severe dehydration, you want to consider giving a bolus. Um, even if they don't have hypotension and compensated shock, you want to do an isotonic infusion of either lactated ringers or normal saline. I think I think most of our urgent cares are probably going to have normal saline. That's what we have in mind. But um, LR is also a good option. Of course, if they are toxic in appearance, you want to do a rapid stopcock method infusion of your isotonic fluids, but if they are not toxic in appearance, you can do 30 to 60 minutes. Oh. In dehydration, so nasogastric tube rather than IV is actually associated with fewer complications and a shorter stay, both um, ED and inpatient, and, and fewer field attempts. One study showed that there were like 27 IV failures compared, compared to every one NG tube failure. And in, in my experience where I work, we just don't do them. And with all this evidence in favor of them, I'm wondering why. And I think it's just because experience, familiarity, and comfort. I think an additional component is the American Academy of Pediatrics considers IV and IV fluids essential equipment for urgent cares who are taking care of children, but NG tubes are just suggested equipment. So those might not be available. If you get a glucose, again, recommended for those patients in whom you're going to start IV and give IV fluids, or, you know, if based clinically you think it's important to check it, the definition of hypoglycemia is variable depending on what source you look at. But generally, uh, most sources agree that if it's less than 60 and the child is symptomatic, then you would treat for hypoglycemia. Uh, if they're tolerating fluids, Again, while fruit juice is not an appropriate oral rehydration solution, it is appropriate treatment for hypoglycemia. If you have dextrose gel in your urgent care, you can also give that. And if they're not tolerating fluids or if they have altered mental status, giving D10 or D25 is the way to go. That's the dosing there. D25 isn't recommended for peripheral IVs. So if, you're, if you have a peripheral IV, D10 is the, is the dextrose containing fluid of choice. And the final note on treatment is I did want to just touch base on disparities in treatment because like most of medicine, systemic racism can affect the care of our patients. This article came out just recently from researchers at Seattle Children's Research Institute, and they did a retrospective study of over 20 institutions that evaluated um, the association between race, ethnicity, and the types of treatments provided to children with AGE. And their breakdown of ethnicity and race, they broke it down to non-Hispanic whites, Hispanic, and non-Hispanic black, and other non-Hispanic race. And their primary outcome was on Dancitron treatment, so Zofran treatment. And so compared to non-Hispanic whites, the adjusted odds ratios of receiving on Dancitron were higher than all the other three race and ethnicities groups, but getting IV fluids or getting hospitalized, uh, the odds ratio is much lower. Um, and th this study in particular did not look at the reasons behind why this might be happening, uh, but they had a couple of different suggestions. It, it is consistent, though, with other studies that have shown that minority patients are less likely to see, receive imaging, lab studies, hospitalization, or IV fluids when they present with acute gastroenteritis. 
Okay, finally, home care. The, the mainstay of home care, like it is in your urgent care, is just continued hydration. I, I would recommend for families about 10 ml per kilo for each diarrhea or emesis that they have at home. Any anti-diarrheal agent over the counter or prescription is, is not recommended because they are not beneficial in pediatric patients and can actually cause harm. Probiotics in, in particular, there have been a lot of studies early on. The studies were very promising as far as decreasing the, the duration of diarrhea and the frequency, but the best quality, most recent randomized controlled trials really show no benefit, unfortunately. Prebiotics, a, a lot less evidence for prebiotics and a lot less studies. However, for me, probiotics and prebiotics are generally low risk and perhaps could be beneficial. So I think it's a good option for parents who just really want to try something for their kids. Zinc deficiency isn't very common in the United States, but in patients who have other nutritional deficiencies or may have recently immigrated from a low income country, you might consider some zinc supplementation for them. Okay, and this poll is really more for my interest and to keep it interactive more than anything else. There's no, I don't think there's one right answer to this question, but do you all in your urgent care settings, do you prescribe on Dancitron or Zofran for home use in these patients with AGE? Again, poll is live, just giving a few moments for people to answer and then I'll let you know what it looks like people are voting. Uh, Looks like most people are saying yes, though we do have a uh, few people that are saying no. Okay. All right, great. Thanks for um, sharing that with me. So the evidence, not surprisingly, on whether on Dancitron home treatment is cost effective is pretty mixed. So one retrospective cohort study showed a reduction in 72 hour ED return but a couple others found really no difference in ED return or in admission after ED revisit. So right now the evidence we have is, is pretty mixed. However, there's a lovely dosage trial going on right now, which is randomized placebo controlled and double blinded. So excellent, excellent top quality study here going on in six Canadian pediatric EDs. And they're looking at the cost effectiveness of using on Dancitron for home use for AGE. So hopefully next year we'll have a little bit better recommendations on whether to do that or not. So this table I put in here is a bacterial treatment of acute gastroenteritis. I'm not going to go through each and every option. Likely, even though you're not getting your stool cultures in urgent care, I hope that you have a follow-up system for these patients to follow up on these cultures and treat if necessary. The main point of this slide is to show, in many cases, if you look at indication for antibiotic therapy, Sometimes antibiotic therapy is not recommended, and sometimes it's only recommended if children are particularly high risk or particularly ill with AGE. And these treatment recommendations are from uh, the European Gastroenterology and Infectious Disease Societies, but they are consistent with recommendations from uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book, which if you don't know is the infectious disease standard for um, treating pediatric patients in the US. Special populations to which um, some of these recommendations might not apply include kids who are less than 12 months old. You want to be more concerned about congenital anomalies such as malrotation with mid-gut bovulus or pyloric stenosis. They're more at risk for serious bacterial infections like UTI. And like I mentioned earlier, milk protein allergy is going to be a bigger consideration for these infants. Anybody with a known metabolic disorder, vomiting especially is going to be a huge red flag. And I would get labs, uh, fluids, and of course, consultation with their specialist as soon as possible. Kids with diabetes are definitely going to need a glucose and a urinalysis to look for DKA. And patients who have renal disease or cardiac history are going to be way more sensitive to those volume changes from becoming dehydrated. And depending on their exact history, you might consider more or less aggressive fluid resuscitation for them. And again, important to consult their specialist with their treatment. Um, I'm gonna to touch on a couple of treatments that are not available in the US, but are available in Europe and Asia, just because you know, some they might come here someday. Race catatrol is an anti-diarrheal agent. It's an, an 
encephalinase inhibitor, which prevents the degradation of encephalins that are endogenous opioids. It's, uh, again, mixed evidence on this one, but our Cochrane database of systematic reviews looked at it and they said there's no benefit. Uh, gelatin tannate is a solution that can alter the gut microbiome and decrease intestinal well permeability. Again, not available in the US, but some studies have shown that it can reduce diarrhea. And finally, bimodal release on Danstron is also being studied. As the name suggests, it, it can last a little bit longer than our current Zofran or Danstron, which only lasts about eight hours. For this one, effects can last up to 24 hours. Okay, so back to our case, our 18-month-old girl who has some emesis, diarrhea, um, looks uh, probably, I would say, moderately dehydrated on exam. How, what are your next best steps in management of this patient at this time? Just uh, giving people some time again to vote, and then I'll let you know what it looks like it's being selected. Okay. So far, it looks like 90-ish percent of people are going with oral rehydration, um, and a few people are going with IV placement and fluid. Uh, no no answers on the other ones so far. So, yeah, looks like it's roughly those ratios, oral hydration okay. the vast majority, with a few people saying IV placement. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I would agree for that patient. I would personally go with oral rehydration as the initial step. Again, since she's actively vomiting, I'll give a dose of ambience tron or zofran and then attempt oral rehydration for her. I don't think IV placement and fluid bolus would necessarily be wrong. It just might be um, a little bit more aggressive than what she needs. And again, medicine's an art, so I'm open and welcome to talk about that with any differing opinions. I have my references available on request, and I believe Robin said these slides are going to go out so you can click on um, this and see them. I just want to copy and paste them in uh, in the document here because I thought it would take up too much space. Uh, so thank you very much. I am so sorry about the initial technical difficulties, and I appreciate your patience with that. And I am ready to answer any questions. I hope you found something interesting or helpful in the presentation. Fantastic. Hope you all can hear me. Um, Dr. Montgomery, that was that was so great. That was so great. Thank you so much for all of your insight. Um, certainly coming from a pediatric urgent care, it was great to kind of um, hear about some recommendations that you might have. And certainly I have some questions too um, to bring oh, to the table. Great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's fantastic, fantastic. Um, we definitely thank want to thank so EB Medicine for hosting this event. Um, yeah, if anybody you. has questions, you know, feel free to put them into the chat here. Um, but let's start off with addressing, I think a lot of these questions address kind of the same patient. So let's talk about a little one, you know, so let's just throw in a six month old, for example, um, that comes in, you know, let's just use vomiting and diarrhea. Okay. Um, I guess my first question that most providers that don't do peds would be is how long can a little one like that tolerate those sorts of symptoms? So when should we be concerned? One day, two day, three day? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think it's one that is, um, you probably could get different answers from different providers. I, again, I think assessing the level of dehydration is probably the most important thing and seeing how dehydrated they are in your exam. If they appear otherwise well and they're having vomiting and diarrhea, but still having a good number of wet diapers, they're crying tears, uh, moist mucous membranes, I think continuing oral rehydration is is fine for a few days. Um, okay. You know, any, any severe dehydration in somebody that young is more concerning. And again, we talked about the physical exam findings that are more concerning, including abdominal tenderness and bloody diarrhea and, um, you know, just any sort of altered mental status is gonna be uh, way more concerning too. So yeah, I agree. It's a little bit more challenging when they're younger uh, to decide that they're okay and it's just gastroenteritis and nothing else. Yeah. The other thing to consider is is babies, particularly less than six months old, if they're having more than, say, five large volume watery stools per day, to me, in my mind, they're probably not going to be able to keep up with that orally. So in that, in that case, I would more strongly consider admission for IV hydration. But I'm definitely open to other thoughts, and I would love to hear what everybody else is doing, too. 
Yeah, yeah. So on that note, just a quick question. Um, let's say we have some new parents, you know, that are very worried. What sort of guidance would you recommend that we tell, um, especially those from the adult urgent cares, how many diapers we got to tell the parents to look for? Like, when is it concerning to come back or go to the ED? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, I, I say... Yeah, I think wet diapers are the easiest thing for parents to monitor, although that can get a little tricky when they're having diarrhea stools because you can't really tell is that is that diarrhea or is that urine in the diaper. For for infants, I say at least four within 24 hours before you go and get evaluated again. That doesn't mean your child's going to get admitted or that um, they're going to need to stay in the hospital or anything, but it is important just to have them checked out by a provider again. And then older kids in you know, toddler preschool age group, I say at least two within 24 hours with the caveats again about other red flags to come back for, including bilious emesis, can't keep any fluids down, uh, changes in behavior, that bloody diarrhea, all of those things kind of together, any of those things, you know, call your healthcare provider, come in again to be seen. Yeah, great, great. Um, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. Six months you said for for Zofran, which was very helpful mm -hmm. um, for mm -hmm. us to know that we can you know start at six months and up. Um, we had some questions about Pedialyte. So, what is yeah. is there an age limit with Pedialyte? Can we use it in the little ones? Oh yeah, like I, I would say down to six months for sure. Um, I, I don't know that I would go six, four to six months, I feel totally comfortable with even younger than that. But once you get younger than that, I wouldn't want to use that as their primary fluid. You definitely want to make sure they're still getting some formula or um, breast milk. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so let's see, we have a question about um, Zofran or Andastron. There was some concern about um, using an EKG surrounding the administration of that medicine. Um, oh, yeah, great question. I love that question. So um, the concerns about the prolonged QTC were really in, they, they were giving like 30 milligram doses via IV, and that's what caused prolonged QT and heart arrhythmias. Uh, and and that, that's what resulted in the black box warning about prolonged QTC. So the, the lower doses in the eight, like the two to eight milligram range that we're giving, there's really a very, very low chance of that complication. Um, so in kids who have known cardiac arrhythmias, arrhythmias or prolonged QTC, I would be cautious about giving it. But in patients who are otherwise healthy and don't have a cardiac history, I would, I don't think you need to get an EKG prior to giving it and I wouldn't hesitate to give it. Okay. Great, great. Um, let's talk for a second about uh, testing prior to administration of fluids, whether you're gonna do oral rehydration mm -hmm. or you're gonna put an IV in and give some IV fluids. Um, mm -hmm. We had some questions about checking blood glucose for every patient that we're gonna hydrate. And then mm -hmm. um, should we be checking a urine sample for every patient that we think we're gonna rehydrate? Specifically, there's a question about if ketones were greater than 80, um, You know, should we be considering a different you know, sort of therapy or treatment course. Yeah, so I know in kids who are mildly to moderately dehydrated, who don't have any other red flags on their history or exam, I just do the rehydration. I don't get a glucose. I don't get a urine. I don't think that those are going to be helpful in changing my management plan. If for whatever reason from the history and exam, I'm concerned about diabetes. So if on your review of systems, the parent says, yeah, she's been drinking a lot more fluid recently, or she's been peeing a lot more recently, then absolutely I would get both of those things. But prior to um, oral rehydration with no other concern for diabetes or another process, I, I don't think they're helpful and they're not gonna change your management plan. If, if you're gonna do IV fluids, again, your analysis, I did not touch on this in my presentation, but it's it's also not helpful as far as distinguishing between which patients are dehydrated and which patients aren't. So I don't think that's going to be helpful either. Okay. okay. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's great. Okay. Um, for And so for those of us who actually can start IV therapy for um, kids in our urgent yeah. care, you know, mm -hmm. I know there's been a lot of discussion surrounding the additive of dextrose. Um, both, you know, more so in the emergency medicine sort of setting. And we know that okay. the research can be a little bit mixed. Um, some emergency medicine providers think that it just really helps with the ketotic stage of these kids that are really dehydrated. Um, mm -hmm. 
do you guys add dextrose to the majority of your IV fluids or do you kind of check a sugar? Tell, help direct us a little bit for those folks that actually can give IV fluids. And you're talking about maintenance IV fluids, right? Or the no, initial... like the really, really sick kid. You know, we're mm. trying to do whatever mm -hmm. we can to prevent them from going to the hospitals. Of course, in our current state, we don't have space for these yeah. kids. So yeah, yeah. Um, whatever we can do, you know, do you recommend us getting some dextrose maybe that for those kids that would have mm -hmm. severe um, dehydration possibly? Um, well, I'm going to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Everything I read and saw is isotonic fluids for that initial fluid okay. resuscitation. I can't really speak to, to maintenance IV fluids because I don't start those, but it, it sounds like there might be something new and cutting edge about adding dextrose to the initial fluid rehydration, which I am not familiar with. So if you know more about that, oh, I would well, maybe it's a new thing. It. I don't know. <laughs> it's an interesting discussion. I mean, we've we brought it up okay. in my clinic, you know, pediatric urgent care. We've brought it up. So I'm oh, just awesome. interested. Yeah, I'll have to look thought. into that more. So that's, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we have time for one more quick question, um, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go learn about the um, urgent care side of EB medicine. Um, okay. What about using the GI PCR panels that are available now for the mm -hmm. diagnosis um, of AGE rather than the individual cultures, C. diff studies, ONP, stuff like that? Yeah. Um, great question. And in my literature review, I didn't see anything about um, using those compared to using Bacteria, just the straight up bacterial culture. You can also get um, sugar toxin when you get your uh, bacterial culture, but I didn't see anything about the, the PCRs being um, a better option as far as testing goes. Are you okay. using that in your urgent care? We don't have the, we don't have mm -hmm. the GI PCRs. We've got the okay. respiratory, but I know that that was a, that is a thing um, mm -hmm. where you can get that in house. Um, so yeah, that was, that was just a question from somebody else. So very interesting thought. Okay. Yeah, that's a um, another interesting thought that I would have to look into more. I know at my institution we don't have the PCRs available. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you all for submitting your questions. This is a great discussion. Um, yep. That's all the time we so have much. now for questions. But um, feel free to go ahead and you can visit the blog on the website um, at ebmedicine.net and um, you can continue the discussion there. Uh, for the last 10 minutes of today's webinar, we're going to tell you about a new resource exclusively for urgent care clinicians um, that I'm super excited about. Uh, I come from emergency medicine background, and I've been using EB medicine for a while for my own CME. Uh, it's fantastic. It's just quick to the point, all the facts, and then you can get CME at the end, which is fantastic. And now we're working, um, you know, I have the pleasure really of kind of being one of the beta testers for the evidence-based um, urgent care side of EB medicine. So um, really excited to kind of direct this over to um, Jeff, who's going to tell us a little bit more about what that means for you uh, in urgent care. And um, again, if you have any questions during this demo, please feel free to put them into the Q&A and Jeff will answer them after the demo. Um, if you like what you see, you can click on the link on the screen or in the chat to actually subscribe to this. Uh, and with that said, I'll turn things over to Jeff. Thanks, Krista. Uh, it was a great presentation, Dr. Montgomery, really re relevant to urgent care. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here with everybody and give you a brief overview of evidence-based urgent care. All right. So um, again, it was it's really great to hear comments like that from you, Krista. We really appreciate that to see and hear how we really helped clinicians in their daily practice. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so a little introduction. My name is Jeff Owens. I'm a practicing urgent care physician assistant in Philadelphia. And I recently joined EB Medicine's team as an education consultant to help meet the needs of urgent care for uh, organizations that are growing rapidly and really looking for an education and training resource to help get their clinicians up to speed. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to just go over evidence-based urgent care. If you do make it all the way to the end, you'll get access to a special bonus. Subscribers are also gonna get access to our course on pediatric acute gastroenteritis, the topic we covered today, which has even more practical tips. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we will um, answer them at the end. So what is evidence-based urgent care? So it's a monthly journal for urgent care clinicians committed to lifelong learning, those who want to partner or mentor for ongoing education throughout their career. 
Our mission at EB Medicine and Evidence-Based Urgent Care is to help clinicians integrate evidence-based decision-making into clinical practice. We start that process by having expert physicians review all of the evidence on a given topic, combine that with their clinical experience, and present you with practical recommendations that you can use on your next shift. Each monthly issue is going to focus on a single topic that's relevant to urgent care. It's written and peer-reviewed by clinicians practicing in urgent care so you know that it's going to be relevant to your clinical setting. Your subscription will include access to all of our new issues as well as our library uh, previous issues. Each article includes four CME credits, so total you can get over 50 CME credits each year. So I'm going to pull up the website so we can see it live here. All right, so all of the content um, that you, uh, you can be accessed on our website or our mobile app. You can also print and save a PDF to take with you to the clinic if needed. When you visit our page, you can browse topics and we can filter by evidence-based urgent care and you'll see all of our previous issues so far. Our most recent one was low risk um, chest pain in an urgent care setting. And we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into closed head injuries in an urgent care setting from May of this year. So if you're short on time, you can go directly to the points and pearls section. You're gonna be provided with a summary of key points, the must know information in just about 60 seconds. When you're ready to take a deeper dive and get the full content, you can click on uh, full issue. And here you're gonna be presented with practical evidence-based recommendations that you can use on your next shift. Each month, each article is gonna follow a consistent format so you can quickly find the information that you're looking for. Each issue is gonna start with case-based presentations uh, based off of real life urgent care scenarios and patients that are gonna help you identify high risk patients and atypical presentations. So I'm gonna pull up the table of contents on the left, which helps you easily navigate through the entire issue. So after a brief overview of the pathophysiology and the epidemiology, we come to urgent care evaluation and management. Here you're gonna find practical recommendations for the evaluation and management of your patients in the urgent care setting. We're not gonna cover things that you already know. We're gonna focus on high risk, commonly missed presentations and conditions. And we'll give you quick access to best practices and key takeaways. In this section, you'll also be presented with any sort of relevant video content. For example, um, physical exam techniques that might help uh, sharpen and hone your skills. The diagnostic testing section covers labs and images, imaging options for you to consider in the workup of your patients. We're gonna pay particular attention to the resources that may or may not be available and relevant to you in an urgent care setting. Again, we'll go to the table of contents on the left. We're gonna to go to a section that's a favorite of a lot of our subscribers. So we're always going to cover special populations, controversies and circumstances that focus on practical takeaways that you can apply to your next urgent care shift. We also include kid bits. We're gonna cover unique aspects of pediatric care to help you manage that patient population. Again, using the table of contents, we're gonna to go to another favorite area of a lot of our subscribers, the risk management pitfalls. Sometimes these are referred to as excuses that don't work in court. Um, these potential pitfalls will help you avoid costly mistakes in making your and managing your patient care. Of particular interest to the medical directors, CMOs, or really anyone who has to worry about the bottom line in addition to providing excellent patient care is the charting and tips section. Here you're gonna be provided with uh, simple changes that you can make to your current documentation that'll help ensure your clinic gets the full reimbursement for all of the services that you provide. Each issue will include at least one clinical pathway. It's gonna give you an easy to follow algorithm for patient care. A lot of our subscribers are using these algorithms as the basis for protocols in their clinics. One unique feature of these clinical pathways is that we're gonna include the level of evidence uh, the associated definitions down here below. So at Evidence-Based Urgent Care, we're gonna review hundreds of articles to create these courses and pathways. 
You're going to find a critical appraisal of the literature that summarizes the quality of the evidence on the topic at the end of each course. You'll also find a reference list at the end of each course. And one of the unique things about us is for all of the references that we're going to provide you, we're going to include information about the type of study, the number of patients, giving you that additional insight about the evidence that you're using. So that's really our issue in a nutshell. I'm going to scroll back up to the top. So as I mentioned, a new issue is published each month. It includes four CME credits, and subscribers will get access to all of our published issues in the past. One of the things that makes us unique is our focus on helping you retain all of this information. We're going to provide you with the content in multiple formats to help reinforce learning, including those clinical pathways I talked about and risk management pitfalls. Of course, we're going to include the 60-second pearls and points. You'll also have access to postscripts to help test your knowledge and calculated decisions through our partnership with MD Calc, which is going to provide you with relevant risk scores and calculators. Once you finish, you can simply click on take CME test and answer the questions to obtain your four CME credits. So to summarize what makes evidence-based urgent care different than the other educational resources out there. So we're laser focused on the practical application of the evidence, helping you learn and retain the knowledge that will truly improve your patient care and improve the bottom line for your clinics. It's designed to be read while you're not on shift to truly help you prepare for your next shift and your next patient. But you can also use it as a point of care to search for our clinical pathways and other relevant content. Upcoming uh, issues include influenza, STIs, red eyes, pediatric bronchiolitis, and more. So now that you've heard about all the amazing benefits from evidence-based urgent care, I'm sure you're eager to get started. You might expect a resource like this to cost thousands of dollars and really eat into your CME budget, but you're in luck for just uh, $449, you can get a one-year subscription. And if you're an urgent care association member, you can save 50% off of that rate. So you can quickly, uh, simply click on the links and we'll also put them in the, in the chat for you to subscribe. And that does include access to the practical evidence-based monthly issues, 50 CME credits per year, and easy searching and accessing the content via the website or the mobile app. And you'll get ac instant access to the full course on pediatric acute gastroenteritis that we covered today. So as promised, if you made it to the end, you get a special bonus. You can get 20% off of our regular price if you uh, subscribe this week, again, you can click one of those links, you can bookmark it, return later, or share it with a colleague. For those of you who are in groups of 10 or more clinicians, you can get even better rates. If you're an owner, CMO, or medical director in urgent care, and you want to learn about our group subscriptions and how they can truly improve patient care and your bottom line, you can click on our ebmedicine.net slash groups. Again, we'll put these in the chat, or you can send me an email at Jeff Owens PA at ebmedicine.net. Again, that'll be in the chat. And I'm happy to answer any questions that might have come up during the presentation. That video back on. Yeah, that was fantastic, Jeff. Thank you for the overview of evidence-based urgent care and hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I definitely can vouch for um, the resource. It's really fantastic. Um, so we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and a big thanks to Dr. Montgomery for a terrific presentation. We really appreciate your time putting everything together. You'll receive an email with a link to the recording within one week and you can post additional comments and questions on EB Medicine's website. For evidence-based urgent care subscribers, you can receive four CME credits for this webinar by reading the corresponding article and taking the CME test. You'll also soon be receiving your upcoming article on pediatric bronchiolitis, very timely for what we're dealing with right now. So thank you again for attending. Text it, simply close your browser and have a fantastic day.